All right, uh, welcome folks. I'm glad to see some of you in person. Um, and uh, uh, we're really delighted uh, to have so many of you attending with us today as well, virtually on Zoom. Uh, my name is Quinn Meekham. I'm the Associate Director here at the Kennedy Center. Uh, and we're so excited to have you join us today uh, for a lecture on global inequality um, by Branko uh, Milanovic. Uh, we'll introduce uh, Professor Milanovic here in a few minutes. Uh, but we'd like to get started with a few announcements. So February is Black History Month, and BYU has a, a wide range of of uh, great programming associated with that. Uh, some of the things that are, are coming right up um, tonight at 7 p.m. in the Varsity Theater um, at the Wilkinson Center is a talk honoring uh, Black History Month. And tomorrow at 11 a.m., Thursday the 3rd of February at 11 a.m., there's a panel discussion as well on um, the, from the Committee on Race and Belonging, Equity and Belonging at BYU, uh, thinking about where we are as a campus on that. Likewise, at the same time, tomorrow at 11 a.m., uh, there's a, an important lecture honoring um, uh, World Interfaith Week. And uh, we have uh, a distinguished uh, speaker who is coming out for that as well. Uh, Marianne Robinson, well, she, she's, she will be delivering it virtually, but Marianne, Mar Marilyn Robinson who is a Pulitzer Prize winning novelist and recipient of the National Humanities Medal will be speaking uh, tomorrow on the harmony of religions. That may be of interest to some of you. Uh, next week in our uh, lecture series, we will be hearing uh, from uh, Professor Ray Crabe, uh, who is a professor of uh, history at Cornell University, who will be visiting BYU and speaking to us uh, in person next week on the topic of the inequality of freedom. Uh, before we introduce uh, our distinguished speaker today, uh, Alejandra Herrera, uh, who uh, is from Bethesda, Maryland, and a major in political science, will offer our invocation. Dear, dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this opportunity to meet as a class that we can hear the words of Milanovic and be able to learn more about um, his thought process when speaking about inequality, that we can learn more about how to create more policy on how to change the matter and how to help many people and that we can just be well informed. Again, we're so grateful for all that you do for us and again for this opportunity to meet as a class and to learn more together. And we say these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, amen. Thanks so much, uh, Alejandra, for, for uh, offering that invocation. Well, <clears throat> it is a, a real pleasure to introduce uh, Branko Milanovic, uh, who is <clears throat> undoubtedly one of the world's leading experts on the topic of global inequality. It's been uh, a major um, area of his research interest for many, many years. Uh, he's currently a senior scholar at the Stone, Stone Center on Socioeconomic Inequality at the Graduate Center of City University of New York. Uh, he obtained his PhD in economics uh, from the University of Belgrade with a dissertation on income inequality in Yugoslavia. And he served as lead economist in the World Bank's research department for almost 20 years, uh, which uh, led him to write his first book on global inequality, income inequality called Worlds Apart, which he published in 2005. He has been a senior associate at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington and has held teaching appointments at the University of Maryland, um, at the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University, uh, and at All Souls College at Oxford and the Universidad Carlos III in Madrid. Uh, because uh, he has spent so much time thinking about income inequality, both within individual countries and globally, uh, he has published uh, in a wide range of academic journals, as well as several books, including The Haves and Have Nots, um, the book of our semester, this semester, Global Inequality, which was awarded 
the Bruno Kreisky Prize uh, for Best Political Book and has been translated into 16 languages. Uh, the book that he uh, will address today uh, talks of the economic and political effects of globalization um, and introduces some novel ways of thinking about uh, the Kuznets curve and, the, and waves of, uh, uh, of how the Kuznets curve may be playing out in global history in the past several decades. Um, he has a new book that has just recently come out called Capitalism Alone, and we are so delighted to welcome uh, Branko Milanovic uh, to our lecture series. Please join me in, in giving him a round of applause. Well, thank you so much. First, thank you very much for the invitation. I really appreciate being at the Kennedy Center, Bram Young. I uh, wish I was there uh, in person, but hopefully that would be possible another year. And of course, I'm extremely honored to have uh, uh, Global Inequality chosen as the book of the semester. Now, as Quinn said in the introduction, um, I worked quite a lot on global inequality and the book, as the title says, is about global inequality. But I would first like, would like to introduce, to explain a little bit what global inequality means. And then I will show you, obviously, like every sort of uh, lecturer these days, a professor, you one has uh, slides. So I would actually have slides and I do plan to speak for about a little bit, maybe more than half an hour. And then we would have time for, for questions and discussion. Uh, so global inequality is technically defined as inequality between all citizens of the world. So imagine if you could have, uh, you know, seven and a half billion people with their incomes and you kind of line them up from the poorest to the richest. Now, we obviously do not have information for seven and a half a billion, but we can collect that information or get an approximation by using household surveys and also adding sometimes tax data from individual countries. Now, household surveys are, are really sort of bread and butter of this work on, on global inequality because they're in principle nationally representative. So you can get a household survey from the United States annually. You get, uh, it's called the Current Survey and it's published every year in March. And then you have microdata, which means individual data on income and number of other characteristics. It's characteristics, it's not only income, you have uh, sources of income. It could be wages, it could be dividends, it could be self-employment income and so on. And you have very similar surveys. And actually in principle, the definitions of the variables should be the same from China, India, Russia, Italy, Brazil, uh, Turkey, South Africa, name it. So then you put all of that information together in one, you can sort of imagine it like almost one enormous file. But on top of that, you have the second problem. And the second problem, even if you have the data on income from individual, from persons, for individuals and individual countries, you have somehow to combine them and to make them comparable. Now you can make them comparable by just using the exchange rate of the US dollar against any of these currencies. But that would not really give you what you're looking to, to obtain, which is an estimate of the welfare of real income of people in different countries. Now, the question is why wouldn't that give you that result? It would not give you because the price level that people face in India, for example, is lower than the price level that people face in the US. You know, every most of the services in the US, of course, are relatively expensive because wages are relatively high. So you can get the same service in India for much less than in the US. You know, economists often like to talk about what is called non tradables, which are essentially services that can be delivered only on a place where, I mean, physically where you have to consume it. And they like to use the example of uh, haircuts. So the haircut obviously in India would be as expensive than the haircut in the US. And the US haircut, as you know, would vary quite significantly even within the United States. You know, it may be cheaper in some areas where the wages are lower and it would be more expensive in cities like New York or LA or Chicago and so forth. So this is our problem. Now to solve that problem we have, and I will not talk much about that because it is a whole area by itself, 
something which is called the International Comparison Project, which is the largest economics project in history, uh, which collects price data from something like 150 countries. So once we collect this price data, we get something which is called price levels for those countries. And we convert incomes, not in the US dollars, as we would have normally done with the exchange rates, but in so-called PPP, which stands for purchasing power parity dollars. So without going into all these acronyms and what they mean, the, the essential thing is to realize is that that, that sort of uh, artifact dollar of PPP has in principle the same purchasing power in any place in the world. So that enables you then to actually rank incomes and to rank and to actually compare incomes of people in India or China with incomes in people in the United States with comparable dollars. So that's what the, the methodological part is. I know it, it might sound somewhat boring to people, but it is actually, it is important to realize that there is an enormous amount of data which goes into the creation of global inequality uh, sort of a summary, if you will, for each individual, individual year. Now, we don't have this data for every year because uh, many countries do not have the service that I spoke about every year. And moreover, until 1980s, we didn't have the results from three large parts of the world and we really could not talk about the world then because the data from the former Soviet Union were collected, but they were not published and they were not available. Uh, the data in China were not actually collected until 1984. And many African countries did not have technical ability to collect the data. So by the mid 1980s, late 1980s, these three problems simultaneously somehow were solved. So from that point onward, we have better data, but they are not ideal. We have and I will not speak about the data today, but we do have problems with even some large countries like China and India that actually have um, uh, not fully satisfactory data. Now, given all of that, let me then start with my uh, PowerPoint. Uh, let me, sorry, I actually, I closed it instead of opening, I, but it will come in a second. And there I would start with, uh, sort of historical data. Uh, oh, let me, I, I'm actually now unable to see my PowerPoint. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually, we tried the PowerPoint and it worked, but now it doesn't work. Okay, let, let me just then go without a PowerPoint. Um, okay, so uh, as I said, the data are actually available from 19, generally speaking from 1988. Now, the interesting part in the data and actually something which, with which I opened the book, as you will see it actually in the first chapter, is so-called elephant chart. I wish I could actually show it to you because it does look like an elephant. It has the shape of an elephant. And that chart shows the changes in income distribution between 1988 and 2000. Eight, and actually even then up to 2013, it has been updated. And even more recently, it has been updated, but the results look a little bit different than the well-known chart, which is called the elephant chart, in, uh, um, in, uh, uh, which goes all the way to, to, well, goes only up to 2008 or 2011. Now, what that chart shows you, it shows you the uh, population of the world ranked on the horizontal axis, the x-axis, change in real income by different income groups. And there, of course, on the horizontal axis, you have everybody in the world basically combined. So you have people who are, would be in the same percentile of the global income distribution coming from very different countries. Uh, obviously, people from the rich countries like the US would be, generally speaking, all within the top of the income distribution. They would be in the top 
20 percentiles. And that's another thing which is important to realize that when you live in a rich country, what uh, seems to you like poverty, and it is maybe poverty given the standards of living in the rich country, these people are globally speaking, not poor. They are actually people who would be uh, very often at a, you know 70th or 80th percentile of the global income distribution, even if they are relatively poor within the US standards. So going back to the elephant chart. So as I said, actually, I'll try to sort of describe it. It shows them, uh, uh, it shows uh, people on the horizontal axis by their income level. And as I said, their real income is on the vertical axis. So the, it has three important points. In, there are three important points in that chart. The first one is around the middle of the income distribution, global income distribution, where you see a very large uh, increase in real incomes of those people. Then the second point, which I'll call the point B, is the point around the 80th percentile of the global income distribution, where you, uh, you have people with almost zero real growth. And the third important point, point C, is the point at the very top 1% of the global income distribution, where you have people with also very large increase in real income. So let me summarize it. You basically have two points, A and C, with very large increases in percentage terms, and you have a point in the middle, point B, with almost zero increase. Now, you say, well, why is it so important or interesting. Why it is interesting and important is that the point A is a point which, as I said, you know, it's a point with a large increase in real income. It's a point where you actually find quite a lot of people from Asia, in particular China, but also other countries like, to some extent, Vietnam, India, uh, Thailand, and so forth. So countries in Asia have had a very high increase in real income. And even if the uh, inequality in those countries, in particular China, went up, it uh, still made people across the board being much better off than they were in 1988. To give you an idea, for example, the Chinese urban deciles, or, or a middle of the urban income distribution, they're sort of the middle deciles of the urban income distribution, had a growth which was about seven, eight, or even 10% per year for a period of 25 years. Now, if you have such a growth over the period of you know, 25 years, your real income increases by about three times. So these were really major increases that happened in what you might call the middle class of Asian countries. And then you go to the point B that, as I mentioned, had very little growth. Now, the problem with the point B is that essentially it was the middle class of the rich countries, of the rich world that happened to be there. Not only happened, but actually that part of the global income distribution did not have much in terms of real growth. So that's why for political reasons, you can immediately see the sort of the, the story, uh, one part of the story, and I'll come to the second part, one part of the story that the elephant chart sort of um, uh, summarizes empirically. It is the contrast between the rising incomes in Asia, in particular China, and the stagnation of middle-class incomes in the rich countries. So the people in the rich countries with the stagnation of, of uh, real incomes are still richer than the people in what you can call Asian middle-class, people whose actually incomes have gone up. So they are still richer, but the gap between the two, of course, is getting smaller. And there is, of course, if you project these things for another 20 years, uh, there would be a displacement. In other words, uh, since global income inequality, like every inequality, is an ordinal scale. So you have people at the top percentile, second, second richest, and so forth. If somebody moves ahead of you, then obviously your relative position drops. So you actually slide downward. And this is something which actually we already see that, that the, the parts of the Asian income distribution are sort of moving into the parts which were until recently practically quote unquote reserved only for the income distributions of the rich countries. And that has of course led, as you know, to political issues. They have, this has led to the issue that many people have raised and to put it very bluntly and very, very bluntly and very clearly, is the stagnation of real incomes of the middle class 
in rich countries, in particular in the United States, the consequence or the result of globalization and of the rising incomes in Asian countries or in China. So if you really, your answer to that question is yes. And there are studies, as you might know, actually, of different um, uh, economists who find that the Chinese imports have had a, 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 a sort of negative effect on the wages of American workers who were working in those particular areas, or who actually also find that outsourcing to poorer countries has had negative impact on the American uh, workers or middle class wages, or longer unemployment spells for people who actually lost jobs, then you really have a political issue. You have an issue, do, do we continue with the globalization as it is, or do we make some changes? Now, before you actually sort of think and say, okay, if that's the situation, we should really make some changes. I have to warn you that when you look from the global perspective, that particular development that I just described is actually good development. And why is it a good development? It's a good development because poor people, which means people in Asia, were able to grow tremendously and richer people, which means the middle class in the United States, indeed has not grown or has grown really very moderately by you know, single digits and so on over 25 or 30 years. But in some sense, it is a good development because the poor people have gotten ahead. So the gap between the poor people or actually the middle class in Asia and the middle class in rich countries has shrunk. So from the global perspective, this is a basically a favorable development. It would have been the same as if you were to look at the US income inequality and notice that, for example, if the US middle class, which is equivalent in a global sense to the middle class in, in Asian countries, if that middle class has become closer to the upper middle class or richer people in the US. So many people would applaud such development if it were to take place in one country. But when it takes place globally, we do have a problem. And I think I wanted to highlight this issue because one has to realize that you often have in income inequality uh, studies, you often have these two contrasting principles. So something which from one point of view might look a good development, for example, cosmopolitan, from the cosmopolitan perspective, the development that I just described is a good development. But from the national perspective, from the policymakers' perspective in the US, it is not a good development because the middle class in the United States has become relative, I mean, has not grown much, has become relatively smaller, and has sort of lost its global position that you once had. So that's the contrast. I'm not going to offer an answer. I was just going to put that in front of you because as you can see, you can actually discuss that development under two very different sort of broad principles. And I totally understand that for the politicians of a given country, what is important is obviously what happens to you know, the country that they are politicians of, what happens there. But from the global perspective, as I said before, uh, the, the, uh, the, the view and the outcomes that we have observed are different. And in some sense, we can say that globalization has had a very favorable role in increasing incomes in very poor countries, uh, which used to be very poor countries like China or countries that are still poor, but they're actually better off than they used to be 30 or 40 years ago, like India. Now, let me then go to the next point, and I would, I'm soon coming to a, to a close. Let me go next to the next point, the contrast between, if you remember, the point B, which is lapses of growth of the middle class in rich countries, and point C, which is a very fast growth among the global top 1%. Now, that global top 1%, and that's, I think, very interesting for you, is composed of essentially people from, still from the rich countries. There are some people from Asian countries, like obviously Japan, like South Korea. There are actually also members there. There are also people from Brazil, <coughs> from Russia, <coughs> excuse me, from South Africa. But one half of the people in the global top 1% are from the United States. And this is also interesting because that means 
that the top 10% of the people in the United States, the richest 10%, are all in the global top 1%. And if you remember when there was a, all this movement about the 99% versus 1%, uh, people who were actually demonstrating were, uh, of course, having in mind, probably, uh, the top 1% in the US. But very often, the people who would be demonstrating would be the top 1% globally. Because, of course, it's easier to be top 1% globally because it includes about you know, 75 million people than being uh, top 1% in the United States, because there you have to be, to be among the top three and 3.5 approximately million people in, in the United States. So that global top 1% that I was talking about is composed largely by really the top of national income distributions in the rich countries. And as I said before, some people from Brazil, Russia, China, South Korea, and so forth. One, of half, one half of them were Americans in that global top 1%. And that global top 1% had a very good period during globalization actually had a very good period all the way to 2008 and the global financial crisis. What happened afterwards, I will say maybe in at the very end and maybe during the Q&A because we now have the, not only uh, the aftermath of the global financial crisis, but we also have COVID, which is really unprecedented development. But if you sort of stop at the global financial crisis, they had a very good period their incomes increased in percentage terms almost as much as the Chinese incomes. And on top of that, they started with much higher levels of income. So when you have a much higher level of income, let's suppose you have something like you know $150,000 per person per year, then a large percentage increase would mean a huge absolute gain. So if you have a doubling of income, you would have earned an additional $150,000 per person per year. And then that point C, when you contrast it with the point B, raises my second political, very important political issue, because it raises the issue of national income distributions. Because now you have the fact that the, in the United States, the top of the income distribution had very good period, had a very high income growth, and the middle did not. So then I'm going back to my original question when I discussed the globalization effects. And then I ask now, how does it look when I compare points B and C? Here, the contrast is between absence of growth in the middle in the United States and very rapid growth at the top. And there is a very nice graph that, uh, that I, those who might follow me on Twitter might see it. Um, and actually I would have shown it today too. Uh, which shows, for example, the, the real growth between, in the US between mid 1980s and 2008, and even 2013, if you extend it, or 2016 even. And basically, it's a flat line at the growth of less than 1% per year for everybody until you come to the 95th percentile, where it really shoots up very dramatically. And that leads you then to, to ask the following question. So maybe the problem was not the issue of globalization and China versus the United States. Maybe the problem was that in rich countries, those who were to some extent losers of globalization were not compensated. Maybe that, that actually the problem was within national income distribution that became much more unequal. And if this is the way to answer the question, then you have an entirely different perception of what I was speaking before when I contrasted uh, China versus the United States. Then you say, well, that's not the problem. Globalization is not a problem. That's not something that we should really deal with because actually globalization is good for the, you know, for the rest of the world, for many people in the world. Maybe the problem is that the national income distributions in rich countries like US, UK, Sweden, actually many people still think that Sweden is a very egalitarian country, but it is still, of course, relatively equal, but it has become significantly less equal over the last uh, several decades. Maybe the problem is there. Maybe the problem is that the tax policies favor the rich. Maybe that there were no sufficient retraining or uh, uh, unemployment benefits were low. Maybe the educational system was really skewed in favor of the rich, so the middle class could not afford. Maybe people actually lost their skills. 
and they didn't they were not retrained so then the emphasis and entirely on the domestic policy and the emphasis on is what to do domestically and i will not go into of course politics now but you will already see that these two trains of thought which basically are reflected very well in the empirical data that we have globally are a, a sort of part of the us normal and many rich countries normal political discourse one on one side are people who are actually focused on uh, changing the rules of globalization or making globalization different and as you know these are the issues with china with trade protectionism with tariff rates with intellectual property rights and so forth and there are also those who actually are talking about as the most recent uh, bill which is in, in front of the congress talking about the the changes in the tax system in the united states in uh, making child benefits much more uh, much more broadly available and uh, 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 more uh, sort of remunerative uh, of uh, change, I mean, in investing in infrastructure and so on. So there you have exactly the same data set as I was saying before, but you have now very different perceptions of the issues. So I would uh, actually, uh, like there are of course many other issues that as you might have seen in the book the book actually deals with global inequality that i actually basically presented here but it also deals with inequality between the countries which is implicitly uh, included there. because when i talk about china versus the united states i really talk about uh, difference in mean income so gdp per capita between these two countries and that's an important part of inequality because that inequality is also behind migration. So if we have the world with vastly different per capita incomes, we actually are bound to have a globalization that would lead to migration. And it, it, the, the reduction of inequality between nation states is not only a sort of a valuable per se, because it would basically equalize opportunities between different parts of the world, but it's valuable also because it would enable people to realize the state their, I mean, to realize their own potential more or less equally around the world, but also to realize it within their own countries. And we would not necessarily have the political issue of migration, which now is an issue in the US, but it's also an issue in Europe, maybe even greater issue in Europe than, than here. And uh, it's also an issue in Japan, for example. So that's the between national inequality. And the third inequality is also implicit in what I was saying, is the inequality within nation states. So when you take then, uh, to summarize, when you take the inequality within nation states, like inequality in the US or inequality within China or inequality within India, and combine it with inequality, which is inequality in mean country incomes, in standards of living between the rich parts of the world and um, sort of middle developed parts of the world and the rich parts and the poor parts of the world, then you have the between inequality and combining that between inequality, between country inequality and within country inequality gives you the global inequality. So it's a, it's a massive exercise in terms of, uh, of data work uh, in terms of thinking, but I would uh, say, and I, why I think actually this whole topic, you, many of you might find, I hope, interesting, is that it is a little bit, what I often say, is like going from a two-dimensional world to a three-dimensional world. Because you when you introduce uh, looking at inequality from the global perspective, and you put all individuals in the world together, as I was explaining before, your perception itself changes very dramatically. I illustrated that with the example of globalization, where you actually can see the same numbers and come to two very different political conclusions depending on your point of view. And such examples actually are you know, multiple, they are bound. And in that sense, I think it is an area which will become only more important with globalization, with reduction of distance, whether it is physical distance or our you know, emotional, intellectual distance with other people in the world, because we will be able to compare our ways of life, which you can do nowadays, especially with you know, ability to connect with, with, with practically everybody in the world. And that would be the topic which I believe would be increasing in importance 
all, uh, politically, but also it would increase in importance because we are now having much more data than we had ever before. And I do expect in the next 20 years, we would have even more. So our knowledge of the issues would become much greater. And let me just say, but maybe I'm over uh, wrapping now, but let me just say that I think what is interesting in the issue like global inequality is that it combines fairly empirical and economic part of the argument and of the discourse with very uh, political international development and international relations part. So you really have all of that as, uh, combined and you cannot unpack that part because you cannot, you can obviously, obviously study only in the empirics, but these empirics are valuable only to the extent that they illuminate political issues or even philosophical issues, as I was saying before, when you have to decide whether you have a cosmopolitan principle or you have more narrow uh, national principle. So let me, uh, I'm not sure if I have actually, let me see, I think I'm still within my reasonable time limit, but I think it would be a good point to stop and to actually sort of open the, uh, you know, to give the opportunity to, to everybody to ask questions and maybe to discuss some of the issues that they already mentioned. And of course, to discuss the COVID uh, sort of situation and how it might impact uh, global inequality. So thank you very much for your attention. Sorry that the presentation didn't work out, but maybe, maybe sometimes it's even better when it doesn't work out, you never know. Those of you in the room, uh, would love to have you uh, come and pose questions up here at the mic. Uh, and those of you on Zoom, uh, if you could just make sure you send your, your question in chat to uh, Stan Benfill, uh, who will uh, aggregate some of those questions and, and pose them as well. I'm just going to start with one um, while people are thinking. Uh, most people in the world have not made a career out of studying global inequality. Uh, but you have, and <laughs> and so I want to know why. Um, oh. at, a, at a personal level, why is this topic so important to you? And maybe you could also share a little bit of the so what. So if this is what we're seeing in the world, and you, you've done a great job in measuring it, um, why should we care? Uh, let you basically, there are two questions, and I'll, I'll try to answer them separately. The first one is that uh, first question, like, why did I get interested in that? I was always interested in equality, actually, as you mentioned, my even dissertation was many years ago uh, on, uh, on inequality. So the inequality part is kind of easy to explain. I mean, I, I don't need to explain it. I would, of course, be very happy to do that in greater detail, but it was something that I've been working for many years. The global part is something that I uh, I was interested, but you know, if you do not have the data, uh, that interest is pretty general and it does not really translate into the obviously numerical or hard part. Uh, and uh, there are two developments there, I think, which are important. The first one, uh, when I worked at the World Bank, I worked in a unit which is quite well known, I think also among your students, is the unit which produces this global poverty estimate based on this famous line, which is to be $1 per capita per day. And methodologically, they collect household surveys that I was describing, <coughs> excuse me, in the beginning in the same way, and this household service could be then used to do global inequality. And that's exactly what I did, and I was very lucky to have been in that unit, the research unit in the World Bank, which does that work. But uh, the, the, inter the second part, which I think is interesting there, that problem that I mentioned about uh, different points of view, cosmopolitan, national, um, it goes back really not, uh, it's not really the economists who have developed. It is really political scientists who have developed. And it goes back to, to John Rawls. It goes back to uh, Bites and people who actually thought of these issues, many of those that I actually mentioned, whether we should really be worried about global inequality, national inequality, how to treat inequality between the countries, uh, from a philosophical perspective and from the perspective of equality of opportunities. Because we are all in favor of equality of opportunity within a nation state, but we don't think 
that we might have equality of opportunity within a country and yet have very unequal opportunities between the countries. And, but the polit political philosophers did not have any numbers. So that was a very sort of you know, abstract way of thinking. And uh, when I uh, sort of realized that actually I could have the numbers, I'm, I'm an economist and I was interested in the topic, I started studying actually political science much more than before. And actually my work attracted originally much more interest among political scientists, uh, political philosophers, sorry, than among uh, the economists. So that was a little bit about the combination of the two. And now very briefly, why does it matter? I think it actually, uh, obviously global inequality doesn't matter as much as national because we don't have a global government. So you, there is, if you have a high global inequality, there is nobody to complain. You know, there is nothing to actually, you can, there are no political tools. However, it does matter uh, for reasons that I just mentioned. It does matter for the reasons of political, of, of um, uh, political of philosophy or of equality of opportunity. It matters for migration and it matters for international politics. Uh, as I explained, when you think of globalization, whether globalization as such should continue in the way that it is. Or, or not. So it does have many implications, a myriad of implications, but we do not have concrete tools to affect it. The, the best tool to affect it is faster growth of richer countries, of poorer countries. So that means that to some extent, if it could be uh, accelerated, it implies uh, aid from rich countries to poor countries. It, imp it implies reduction of tariff barriers for the poor countries. So these are the, the, uh, the policy instruments, but as you can see, they are very indirect policy instruments. We do not have global taxation system. We do not have global transfers. There are no, no tools for that. And let me just say one more thing, actually, before I forget it. Uh, it has also very strong implications for climate change because global inequality in income is practically a carbon copy of global inequality in emissions. So really it is rich people and rich countries that are much greater contributors to climate change than poor people and poor countries that basically do not consume energy and do not emit um, uh, carbon. So this is of course another implication. The greater uh, global inequality, the more would be the, uh, the climate change. Uh, I mean, more difficult it would be to address climate change. So we, we have a, we'll take a couple of questions here in this room and then we'll go to the, our Zoom audience. Go ahead and just please introduce yourself when you ask a question and, um, and if you're a student, what are you studying? Okay. Hi, my name is Savannah Levitt and I'm studying political science. And something I had a question about is I understood that you said that um, more migration happens because of greater global inequality. But can that happen the opposite way so that um, more migration causes less global inequality because as migrants are coming to host countries, they're getting better jobs and better incomes? And can I ask you this question very quickly because it is an excellent question and it, the answer is very straightforward. You have basically answered it yourself. Yes, uh, uh, global, I mean, more migration would reduce global inequality. But of course, the problem there with dealing with migration is a political issue. But in terms of whether it would reduce global inequality, the answer is unambiguous, yes. Thank you. Hi, I'm Cope McKechnie. I study history at BYU. I'm wondering, um, at the end of your introduction, you say, I offer now to the reader a duty or the pleasure of taking the first steps on the road to the study of global inequality and perhaps ultimately to global governance. And I'm wondering if that's the direction that you see the world headed or are you envisioning more isolationist policies? Well, should I answer now or because it's a great question I have to say. So Stan, what do you? Yeah, I think go ahead and answer now. Okay, I'll, I will I'll be very time. good because I would be I'll try to answer them very uh, sort of compactly. Uh, it's a great question. I actually, uh, 
I wish I were more optimistic because maybe I was more optimistic when I wrote the book. I actually thought that there would be small but incremental steps towards uh, formation of some global institutions. Uh, for example, to give an example, uh, we could have a global institution that would tax, I was talking about carbon emissions. We could have a global institution that would actually collect the money, uh, imp impose the same tax rate in all countries on a given, on a given uh, uh, good or a service, and then collect that money, and then use that money to fund green technologies in poor countries. So that, I think that's technically doable. And I was more optimistic that it would happen when I wrote the book. I'm a little bit less optimistic now because we see actually an increase in a sort of pro-national policies. I'm not going to call them nationalists, but sometimes they come close to that. And we, don't, we do see that in many countries. And so I've, I'm sort of more skeptical because it seems to me that currently there is less willingness to share some of the national prerogatives globally. Because if you want to talk about global governance, you have to share some of the prerogatives with the rest of the world. And that doesn't seem very likely right now. Thank you. OK, well, I think that um, we'll have a couple of uh, Zoom questions here. I have a number of questions to choose from. Um, let me ask one that follows up on this most recent one. This is from, from Craig Jones. Um, what is the connection? Do you see a connection between eras of right populism, right wing populism, and global inequality? Is there uh, any kind of direct relationship between those two that you found in your research? That's the first one. You know, it is very difficult to, uh, to um, uh, determine that. I think it's actually impossible to determine in a simple causality form. But as I was explaining, so today, I do believe that there is a relationship, particularly what I was calling points A and B, that if you look at them and a high growth rate in Asian countries and low growth rate among the middle classes in the rich world, I do think that this is actually um, a sort of a, uh, the basis on which so-called populist reaction happened. And I'm not talking only about the United States, you know, that reaction happened, for example, in France, it happened in, in um, Spain happened in the UK. So it's actually not limited to only one or two countries. I think it's much broadly, uh, much broader um, in, in rich countries. So yes, I do see that relationship. Uh, can it be proven? Uh, I don't think so, because I think it can be only indirectly proven, as I was saying before, by showing that, for example, the wages in the sectors that were particularly affected by uh, Asian imports have not risen much unemployment has increased it was harder for people to get jobs after they lost them new jobs after they lost their previous jobs so yes indirectly i think that that connection can be shown and i think there was a preponderance of evidence now to arguing that it indeed there was this connection between globalization and a stagnation of the middle class incomes and that it was much less technological change and much more globalization Great. Um, thank you for that. Um, let me let me now. Um, I've had a couple of students ask about the impact. Of both Chloe Johnson and Eliza Rowan ask about the effect of COVID on these trends and, and the pandemic. And I know that was something you were hoping to get to anyway. So why don't we address that now? It is such a difficult uh, question because uh, we are uh, still in the midst of the pandemic, so the the outcome is not you know obvious you know before uh omicron we thought actually we may be to moving towards the end so we could actually say okay a different growth rates of, of countries are now going to go to their normal quote unquote normal pattern but now we are not sure about it now having said all of that so what do we know until now what we know until now is that uh for the first time in the in the last 40 years uh there was no decrease in global inequality. Uh, when I was talking of all of this, I actually probably even forgot to mention that uh, since China started growing very fast and then was really replaced as the engine of growth uh, by India, global inequality has been on the decline. It's very high, but it has been on the decline. Now, with COVID, it has kind of stopped, and it has stopped because, for two reasons in particular. Uh, uh, first, 
China is no longer a country which contributes to the reduction in global inequality because it has become sufficiently rich that essentially its impact, its growth, really has zero impact on global inequality. But on the other hand, India had a very bad performance with the decline of real uh, GDP by 10% in 2021. So that essentially meant that the reduction in global inequality has come to an end. But on top of that, we had very diverge, di divergent uh, uh, movements in within national inequalities. We had, for example, in the US data for, for the last year, show the decline in the US inequality, which essentially was the result of the large programs that have been voted by Congress and that actually gave substantial amounts of money to people to compensate for the loss of their jobs and income. Uh, but on the other hand, in many other countries, we have had a significant increase in inequality. So when you put all of this together, basically, according to the World Bank, these are the most recent results, which are, of course, not, uh, uh, how should I say, definitive, but essentially you had no decline, further decline in global inequality and possibly a slight increase. But that's only about, we're talking only about income. But of course, inequality between rich and poor countries has been enormous in terms of vaccination, as you know, the vaccination in poor countries in a single digits in percentage terms. Uh, and in rich countries, it's over 90% oftentimes, and very often, almost most of them over 80%. And then within countries, you had a very significant cleavage between people who were actually more exposed to the likelihood of uh, contracting the virus and those who were actually less, uh, less likely to do that simply because their jobs could be done from home. So, you know, there are many other types of inequalities which have been revealed by the crisis, not only income inequality, but others. And uh, like last one that I could mention is also inequality in education. You had basically in many countries, people who have lost uh, several months or even a year or more of education. So that would have really, I think, uh, long-term effects. Okay, thank you. Quinn, do we want to go back to some uh, questions in 238 there? Uh, go ahead, Sam, if you have one. Sorry, I didn't hear. <laughs> uh, if, uh, if All right. Have, if you have more questions uh, from the Zoom group, we've got about five more minutes, okay? Oh. Okay. Um, let me ask you then, um, had a couple of students ask the question about, is there any way for individuals to contribute to the reduction of inequality, or is this such a large, uh, a large problem that it's, it's really, you know, uh, impossible for any one individual to uh, make any impact on this question? You know, uh, my position is difficult here now, here, because I think that uh, most people uh, wish actually when they hear problems, and that's also true for climate change, uh, wish that they themselves would be able to contribute to sort of lessening the problem. I have to say that when it comes to inequality, inequality is such a big problem, as you said, it's uh, multidimensional and it's a problem which is not only technically linked to individual, I mean, it is a result of, a, of millions or billions of individual actions. Uh, even people who are very wealthy cannot, even if they were to give money, they would contribute some, obviously, because now there are so many billionaires. But uh, for normal people, it is really almost impossible, I have to say, to have an impact on global inequality. Uh, where they might have an impact, and that's why I actually believe that essentially inequality is, a, is an issue that can be only dealt by groups, in other words, by government, they might have an impact on reducing national inequalities uh, through political action or you know, sort of supporting policies that would reduce inequality. They could have also an impact on re lessening uh, inequality between countries, again, 
uh, through support of policies, whether they are migration policies, pro-migration policies, or whether they are policies of aid, or whether the policies of opening the markets to, let's suppose, poor countries in Africa. So they can have that impact. But as I was saying, this is not a, this is an impact which goes through a policy which normally has to be enacted by nation state. So in other words, if you really say, let's suppose you say, okay, well, I would like to open US market to imports of textiles from Africa. You cannot that do yourself. I mean, you might go and try to find um, you know, textile products produced by Ethiopia, but you know, it's not going to be easy and you're not going probably to find it in your store. But that was something that only a nation state, which means the United States in the particular case or any other country can do. So it is really uh, uh, through political action that individuals can try to make a change. But I think directly, I think it is, I'm, I, I think it's quite difficult to do much. Okay, thank you. Um, let me let me do one more question here. I know we're, we're getting close to one o'clock. This is a question from Megan Esplin. How can we best, and this is probably speaking of, of, from a policy perspective, how can we best help reduce inequalities in poor countries so as to lead to a decline in global inequality? You know, I think of, of the, the inequalities in poor countries are essentially a result of, uh, you know, there are many factors, but including policy in, in poor countries. It is, I think, very difficult for somebody in a rich country to, uh, to have much of an impact on income inequality in poor countries. Uh, clearly, if people, for example, uh, go, uh, young people from the United States, what it is done through the uh, different US programs which exist, they go and actually very often sort of share their knowledge and you know help. Uh, I actually know direct examples of people who actually worked in, in, in countries in Africa and they have actually brought things uh, there. Uh, so that's that's one way. But you know, as you, as I was saying, uh, if you were to go to a country, I suppose in 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 Central America or Africa or South America, the the impacts are really indirect. It is really the the governments of those countries that have a major impact in deciding, for example, uh, how how to deal with corruption, in deciding how to deal with tax policies, in deciding to actually. Uh, uh, give certain advantages to the sort of most uh, promising areas, economic areas and so on. But uh, again, on the individual level, this is not uh, dismissing that, but I'm just saying these are really small incremental um, advent, uh, improvements, which are valuable, but you would need to have millions of people do that small improvement in order to have really a, a big sort of big bang or something that you would notice. Okay, thank you. I think Quinn will turn turn it over to you. Okay, um, thank you, Dr. Milanovic. We really appreciate your time with us today. We appreciate the, the big lens uh, that you take as we think about uh, how to measure this and, uh, and the implications both at the national and global level. Uh, and we really appreciate your time today. Thanks for joining us at BYU. Well, thank you very much again for inviting me. Thank you for selecting my book and uh, thank you for the attention and excellent questions that uh, uh, the students of course and uh, have asked so it was a pleasure um, and i hope to repeat it at some point uh, in person thank Great. you very much thank you we appreciate it yeah, thank you very much